Welcome to Connect with Success with Dr. Lynette Scatis Watilla, where we help connect you with knowledge. Our mission is to lead you to a new and exciting way of understanding, responding to, and helping all those with autism. We hope to expand your thinking about how to best serve these amazing people and how to support you in your daily struggles and celebrations. Welcome everyone to episode two of our Connect with Success podcast built around the success approach. The person who coined it, Dr. Lynette scott Tiswatilla, and the people who use it and benefit from it every day. In today's episode, Dr. Lynette's going to discuss one of the most basic components of helping a child or adult with autism. She's going to give it a name that you may or may not have heard before in the field of autism. My name is Dr. Richard Smith, and I'll be facilitating our discussion about this basic idea that we all need to know when it comes to autism. So Lynette, what's our term for this episode? Today's term is readiness. And readiness, what I want everyone to know and understand, is observable. So I like to define it as an observable state of the human condition, wherein a child or an adult is actually displaying preparedness, adequate preparedness, to meet the demands of what's going on around them. And it's important to know that it's observable. That we're actually gonna see readiness because in so understanding that we can see it, we're gonna know to look for it. So parents and teachers can actually assess if a child's ready. And it's sort of like using a um, little mental checklist. And if the child meets the criterion and this little checklist, then you kind of have the green light as a teacher or as a mommy or daddy to go ahead and approach the child and maybe engage them in something you want them to do or learn or attend to. And so this really is more of observation. Like I remember as a kid being in school and the teachers would say, one, two, three, all eyes on me. It's not about you being ready to receive. It's about us observing the fact that they're ready to receive. Yeah, exactly. Um, And that little uh, phrase, one, two, three, eyes on me, that teacher, what she was doing, Rich, was eliciting your readiness. So she was influencing you to shift your attention to what you might've been doing otherwise. So she was actually eliciting readiness. Um, But if she assessed for your readiness first, as she scanned around the classroom and everyone was already looking at her, she probably wouldn't have to prompt that. So she would observe that your eyes were on her. So this little mental checklist we talk about, she had in part, in her drop-down box of things to check off. And that was where the the child's eyes are. Um, If we try that little technique with a child or an adult with autism, one, two, three, eyes on me, um, it may not elicit their eye gaze. Um, And there's many, many reasons why. And all those reasons are understandable and and part of how they process or or don't. Um, But it's not just their eyes. There's other clues about them. So another part of the checklist that's really important for parents and family members and and staff um, is where the body is in space. What what is the body doing? What direction is the body facing? Is the child frontal to you? Is the adult sideways to you? Um, Is the adult back to you? Um, And then the other little clue or thing you want to think about is what are they doing with their voice? Are they vocalizing? Are they talking? Are they actually verbalizing, speaking? Mm -hmm. Um, Are they sort of having a weird sort of groaning voice? You might call it weird or might sound strange to you. What is happening in their, in their voice right there? What are they, what are they communicating or what are they experiencing is what you're trying to discern by watching their eyes assessing their body position and listening to their voice. So that's sort of the the mental checklist, at least that occupational therapists and many other professionals will will be trained to use or to to assess. So we know if a child is ready for us to approach them or engage them. Um, I think the hard part though, is that most parents for sure, um, and many professionals don't know that. They don't know how to assess, it's unfamiliar to them. Um, they don't know that readiness is a, is a precursor to focusing. And so they miss readiness or they misinterpret readiness. And that is not helpful to the person with autism. 
So I want to kick off uh, the message today with a little story um, that I had just uh, in observing readiness in my own profession. So Lynette, we first met in uh, with my daughter, Madison, who, uh, you know, we were trying to work on getting a diagnosis um, for for autism. And then we did some pretty decent training um, and some collaboration in terms of parent and and therapist, um, just getting Maddie ready to learn and in and, and her own headspace. And we went through a lot there in collaboration. So, and I really did feel that that prepared me as a professional. So I wanted to share this little story of readiness that I had as a teacher. So I'm coming out of my office one day at school and um, coming down to the office for something. And I noticed that there was a student who was being disciplined in the principal's office, but he was really just shut. He had shut down. He wasn't mm. listening to anything that anyone was having to say to him. He just, it wasn't, they, they couldn't get the information out of him. He wasn't offering the information up. He just kind of closed down for whatever reason. He was not prepared to listen to what they had to say. So I asked the administration if I could, you know, remove the student for a second. We walked down to the gym and he said to me, all I want to do is run away. Mm. And I said, well, that's fine, but we know we can't run away at this moment. So why don't we just do some laps? So he started doing some laps around the gym and uh, I would ask him some questions while he was running. And then he said, I want to shoot hoops. So I said, all right. So he, I gave him a basketball. He started shooting hoops. And after a while he started running around again. And eventually he sat next to me and said, you know, I'm just so frustrated because I don't think anyone listens. And this is what happens today. And I just thought, wow, this was amazing. I didn't do anything out of the ordinary except see that he wasn't ready to listen and offer him the opportunity to kind of run out some of that frustration. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, you know, I remember as a kid being, you know, why don't you just run out, you know, get some of that nervous energy out and then maybe you're going to be ready to talk. This is was kind of the early onset of observing readiness. Would you you think? Yeah, I do think. And I, I, your story is so helpful, Rich, because it reminds us, um, that readiness is something we all have. It's a dynamic, fluctuating state. So the most attentive and um, highly observant person um, sitting at the opera, you know, (laughs) deep into the performance, if they have a full bladder at that point, and there's no way they're going to make it till the end of the opera to relieve themselves they're not going to be able to maintain a good state of readiness to complete the task of listening. They're going to have to take care of their body. So it's a fluctuating dynamic state. Now, once they relieve themselves, this is a very average everyday happens to everyone kind of scenario. They come back and they're ready again. It's that primitive. It's that common. It's that core to all of us, but for children with autism, The difference is what makes them unready isn't always something obvious like a full bladder. Um, It's how they're wired. It could be many, many things that we'll get into in future podcasts that rob these kids of their readiness to attend. And I want to point out that, you know, readiness, the readiness state for sure, is very different from skill. So if I'm going to tell a seven-year-old with autism Um, that she needs to get her shoes on and tie her laces and get in the car. Um, But as a mommy, I choose to tell her that when she's watching uh, one of her favorite shows, she's not going to perform that skill. She can, she can perform the skill. She can put her shoes on and tie the laces and walk to the car, but she is literally unready at that point. And so what sometimes, because like we said in the first episode, we're focused on product versus process, Mm -hmm. mom might get very frustrated or babysitter or grandma or nanny might get very frustrated that she is not tying her shoes. I know you can do it. Come on, do it. Well, it's not a debate if she has the skill, but she's unready. Mm -hmm. And so instead of coming down on the fact that she didn't do it, she didn't produce it, we have to step back and determine where is she at in the process? Well, she hasn't even made sense of the words, put your shoes on because her mind is on the show. Mm -hmm. And while that probably sounds very easy to see to the listeners out there, as they listen to these little scenarios we're painting here, it's very hard to remember in the moment, because if what you're rushing out the door for is to drive your kid to school, 
or to get your toddler to the doctor's appointment who is sick with the fever and the older child who's seven with autism isn't putting on her shoes, you don't really think necessarily, gee, maybe she's paying attention to the show. And then worse yet, what you might do if you do figure that out is click the show off. Right. <laughs> and then that unleashes a whole nother set of circumstances that will probably, depending on the child, further delay you. So, you know, we really want to understand our child's readiness. We want to watch their eyes, listen to what they're saying, watch their body. And after we do this for a while, at least in occupational therapy and, and people skilled in the success approach way of doing things, they come to sort of have an MO, like a modus operandi, that they, they understand how the child operates. And so they might discern that this little seven-year-old needs a three-minute warning. You know, in three minutes, we're going to turn off your show and get your shoes on. Well, that's just like the teacher you had that said, one, two, three, eyes on me. Right. Only it was a three minute difference. That three second difference versus three minute. Do you see that? Absolutely. Because they might not be ready to receive that message at the time. They, they're so they're so entranced in what they're doing at the that's moment. It. that What they're receiving is the show. Right. right. And they're not really fixated on the next steps because they're not hearing it. They're not ready to receive it. That's right. And, and so, so that, you have to help them shift. It really is attention shifting is the precursor to readiness. Um, you have to be able to shift attention. And a lot of our kids and adults with autism have some core problems with attention and attention shifting or uh, uh, shifting or sustaining attention. So we really want to treat that and understand that in occupational therapy and the success approach way of doing things. Um, and there's a whole, um, I would say, uh, arsenal of, of opportunities and methods that will help us to know where a child's at with readiness and how to move them to a state of readiness. Um, so your teacher knew one, two, three, look at me was going to work, but she probably wasn't treating children with autism at the time. Right. So I mean, we've talked about that state of readiness and, 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 and ob observing that a student or a child is ready for it. What does it look like? How, how, mm. how can we assess that? Yeah, well, by looking at their eyes and watching their body and listening to their voice, you can see where their eyes are on the material that you might be wanting them to do. So when um, your seven-year-old doesn't respond to get your shoes on um, because you notice her eyes are on the TV, you can bring the shoes to her, right? Mm -hmm. You can bring them to her to move them into her line of vision and let her know soon it's time for shoes or in two minutes it's time for shoes. So that increases the chances that her eyes are on the right thing that you want her to eventually make contact with or make use of. Okay. So she would say, we would say at that moment she was focused. Um, and in that case, you brought it to her. But in your example of one, two, three, look at me, the teacher just by a cue got your eyes to look at her face. And mm -hmm. so your teacher was assessing her, your eyes as a whole, all 20 of you, 25 of you. But we also can tell from the body position. So when a child's ready, they're usually frontal to you. They're facing you or they're um, able to turn to you or about to turn to you. Look at their shoulders, the direction of where their shoulders are and where their face is and their eyes are, are headed. And then the sound, you know, if they're busy, if they're scripting, a lot of our uh, young adults and even older adults or children script. So if they're in the middle of a script, which is sort of repeating something that's not in the present, you know, a script from a movie or a cartoon or a song or something. If they're using their voice to, to rehearse that or to state that out loud, they're probably not attending to or focusing on you. And so that's not a, a, an example of high reading the state, a okay. quiet child or a child who is um, not doing sounds and being more still with their voice or quiet with their voice is a child who's more ready to hear something coming in to their ears. So those are what it looks like using their eyes, facing the, the subject or the uh, materials or the family member or adult with their body and having more of a quiet voice than not. And so why is it then so important that we see these signs? I mean, and I, it can it can lead to a lot of frustration on the, on the point of uh, teachers and parents to butt heads if they're not ready. Um, yes. Why is it so important for those parents and teachers to understand this readiness as an observation? Well, I, I think there's two reasons why it's so important. One is the child's not able to process unless they're ready to receive. It's very simple. They're not able to process unless they're ready to receive. So most of the time we're engaging a child to help them process, learn, or do something, right? Mm -hmm. 
So that's critical. They must be able to process it so they can receive the information. But the second reason is because we want to make children with autism more aware of exactly what they're supposed to pay attention to. We want to bring what is salient to their consciousness so they can free up all their energies to focus on that because they have to, by nature, many of them attend to many, many different things that are not salient. So we want to present our information when they're ready so that what we're presenting is salient. It does take up their attention. It does take up their eyes and and what they're looking at. It does occupy their ears and what they're hearing. Then information will go in. If we don't, and this is why it's important for us as adults to do it, we are not only wasting our time, so to speak, nothing with a child is a waste, right? But Mm -hmm. we're not as productive. We're not as, um, just we would say, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Um, kind of spinning our wheels, if you will, if we don't wait for good readiness. And that makes us feel like I told them five times to do this, <laughs> or I, I gave it to her six different ways. When is she going to take this bite of food? You know, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> she's not going to, if she's not ready to, to take it in that it's there. So I think it minimizes frustration on the person with autism. That's for sure. And it also frees up the adult to be a little more uh, potent with their time and energy. A little more deliberate too, in in the way that they're approaching to make sure, Mm -hmm. as you said, not, you know, that way we're not spinning our wheels with our children, repeating things that they're not ready to hear over and over again. So, you know, we're, we're looking for different ways to um, make sure that our children are ready. And sometimes they need that little physical action to prepare themselves so that we can see that they're ready. And I'll, you know, we've been through three or four, three trampolines, at least in our household. And I'd say, you know, maybe you need a couple of jumps before we're ready to move on to the next thing, or you need to get that (laughs) excess energy out so that we can be ready to to proceed to that next thing. What are some other practical tips that you can offer our listeners to help with observing readiness if they see that the student, that their child's not ready? Mm -hmm. Good, great question. Well, you've discovered in your family, uh, what you said, like little activities, sometimes physical activity, jumping on a trampoline, uh, doing a somersault, doing a jumping jack, spinning around three times. Um, Those aren't things that the average person thinks of because the average person is is not trained in the area of occupational therapy, which is my background. Um, And so I'm going to first say that it's best to work with your occupational therapist Mm -hmm. who should know and understand your child and his or her readiness state and what influences it. And in that discovery, they may know that they are seekers, you know, they need certain information through their senses that they're seeking sensory input. Um, In your case, the example you used, Rich, um, you might have children who seek vestibular or Mm -hmm. balance stimulation. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they channel their energy to seek that so that it kind of fills their cup. And then, ah, great, ready to go. It's kind of like a cup of coffee for us. It like fills our cup, and then we can go do things. Yep. So that caffeine, that coffee brings us to readiness, just like a trampoline can bring your child to readiness. But some some children don't need to be increasing their their, um, sensory input. Some need to be quelled or Mm. or diminished. Um, So sometimes things like headphones and OT will prescribe or a speech therapist might prescribe to dampen the sound Um, or cocooning and a deep blanket. You know, a lot of occupational therapists do a lot of dampening um, that we're going to talk about as as a strategy. And why we use it in future podcasts about sensory systems. Um, But those are some of the the tips of the trade as governed by occupational therapy to help that child's readiness state be optimal so learning can happen. Okay. So uh, how hard is it to recognize readiness then in terms of knowing when our child is is ready to receive that message? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, for a skilled interventionist or a parent that's worked with one, um, it's, it's not so hard. You kind of get used to looking at the eye gaze, listening for the voice, making sure that the body is frontal. But again, you know, it's, it's that intentionality, Rich. It's that extra layer, that extra time, that, that willingness as the adults, as the mommy or the auntie or the babysitter, you know, to stop, look and listen before you expect. Again, if it's all about process and not product, you have to support Mm -hmm. the process. You have to set the child up so the process can be gone through step by step instead of just expecting the child to do it. So I would say that it's easy to recognize. Readiness is very easy to recognize. 
But the work of assessing it can be challenging if you're not used to listening and looking at that child in that way. And so it goes back to this transdisciplinary approach, you know, knowing your therapist and, and having that connection with them and how that connection is formed with your whole community as your family to, to meet the needs of that child. Absolutely, because that transdisciplinary team is going to have different observations about readiness. So this, the teacher, your general ed teacher, your special ed teacher, uh, your intervention specialist, they might have a, your child in, a, in an environment where there's a small group. And so readiness might be different in that environment than it is at home with Nana, you mm -hmm. know, eating dinner. So there's different influences on readiness because there's different information coming into the nervous system that the child has to tune out in order to be more ready. So you do want that transdisciplinary understanding of readiness, what influences it, and then what does a child need that anybody can use to really get them ready? Yeah, that'd be a great um, on a future episode, uh, just talking about in terms of classroom readiness yeah. and, and just looking at that because there's lots of different tools and tips and tricks. But I mean, it really goes back to understanding your students and really reading through their needs and and understanding uh, how to best meet their needs. It's that's a whole episode. It's a whole we might have to do a crossover episode on that one. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm ready if you are. <laughs> Join the cast from Connect with Success for our first ever virtual live event for Autism Awareness Month on Saturday, April 17th, 2021. We'll be highlighting those who've been champions of the success approach, talking to community partners, hearing some special stories of those impacted by the success approach, and a few more surprises up our sleeves too. Be sure to follow the Success Approach for Autism Facebook page for more information about how you can join this highly anticipated autism event. So our challenge for this week is to look for signs of readiness in the person that you know and love with autism. Watch for patterns that you'll learn about by looking at their eyes, listening to their voice, and watching their body. Try to imagine their readiness profile. What do they look like when they're really ready? That'll help you know going forward when they aren't. What struck me in this episode is that readiness is about gauging if our audience, and in this case, our individual with autism, is ready to receive information that we wish to convey, as much as um, what to do if we observe that they are not ready to, quote unquote, hear us, per se. Am, am, I, am I understanding this correctly then? Yeah, I think the takeaways here are that Readiness is observable. It's a state of preparedness that someone is ready to meet the demands of the environment. Uh, it's also important to remember that it's dynamic. It's going to fluctuate and we all have readiness states. And remember that readiness is not the same as skill. And that lack of readiness is going to limit a child or an adult's performance. And then most importantly, work with your occupational therapist, your professional team, to learn your child's readiness profile or how they operate. So when they're unready, you can use the just right methods to turn that around. We hope that you learned something today to help you on your journey with autism. We'll share more on our next Connect with Success podcast. Until then, expect success. The Success Approach is a registered service mark protected under intellectual property law. Unless otherwise specified, all music, audiovisual, and proprietary content shared in this podcast is property of Autism Productions, LLC, and its sister agency, Integrations Treatment Center. The use of this content is unlawful without the expressed written consent of aforementioned agency. For more information about The Success Approach, please go to our website at www.thesuccessapproach.org.